Hello, hello out there. Max here, co-founder and chief growth officer at Influx Marketing. And today we're at the Aesthetic Society meeting here at the Miami Beach Convention Center. This is the annual meeting of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Every year I walk the aisles and I end up spending most of my time chatting with industry peers and marketing minded physicians. And I always walk away really feeling like I have my finger on the pulse of what's happening in our space. So this year, I thought it would be fun to take it a step further and have those same discussions that I always find myself having but do it in a podcast format so that I can bring them to you at home. So if you're like me and you want to be dialed in on what's happening within the world of patient acquisition and digital marketing for aesthetic practices, follow along and I hope to bring you some valuable insights through these conversations that you can use to take your practice to the next level. Can't take myself seriously. All right, let's roll with it. Okay, we're back, and I'm very happy now to tell you that I'm joined by Tom Siri, who is the founder and chairman of Real Self. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you. In person. In person. So uh, what Tom is uh, referencing here is that when we first met, he made actually a big announcement on one of the early episodes of the Technology of Beauty, hosted by- Which is- uh, We have our branded yeah. Technology of Beauty water here. Oh. Prog placement already happening in your show. I like it. Always. I do. You got to give the shout out to Grant and TOB. Yeah. But uh, you made a big announcement back then on one of the early episodes, but it was during the pandemic and you joined us by way of Zoom. And I remember meeting you through the little, I would lean down and sit, introduce myself. And that's how we first met. And we talked about maybe coming on and doing our podcast at one point. Now here it's finally happened. Harry did. We just had to let a pandemic passed by us and a little matter of a pandemic had to get past that yeah it's true but i really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us um for will you just briefly because this is sort of going to be a truncated interview of course from a normal podcast episode will you just briefly kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and of course uh we know that leads to the founding of real self but maybe yeah. a, a abbreviated background yeah i've i um i'm named siri so i get a lot of interesting moments that check in the hotels like oh like hey i gotta turn my phone off i say hey siri but uh um my uh background is uh tech i've been in a technology innovation space for my almost my entire career i always wanted to be an entrepreneur as a kid you know like yeah you know that kid who's always selling something on the corner of your door it's something you're know, just constantly trying to find a way to you know make a buck and uh you know whether it's a paper route or a you know, garage sale or selling something my dad didn't know I was, that I had offered, you know. Um, Real Self was, uh, is a journey that I've been on for, well, it's been 16 years, I guess, um, which makes me feel really old, but also I'm really proud of the legacy of what we've built and the relevance it carries even today. Uh, we've intercepted over 100 million consumers last year across 15 countries, multiple languages, and... I think we still are living by what my dream was, which is to make the category of aesthetics more accessible, to make it something that wasn't stigmatized, that it uh, empowered patients to tell stories and doctors to have a format which elevated them and then dragged them out down into the muckraking and all that stuff. Hard thing to pull off. It's not always perfect, but um, I have no regrets and have enjoyed what it's done for me, my family, my friendships, um, and how I think I've been able to help a lot of small businesses and people get safer, better outcomes. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I would agree that it's definitely helped to popularize and broaden the awareness of the subject of aesthetics and consumer lens. I guess, you know, when my friends started, there was, when my friends saw me start this, they were just thought I was crazy. I mean, they still think I'm crazy. But... Um, this idea they thought was like, why would somebody want to share this very private, very personal decision on the internet? And now here we are, and that seems kind of silly, right? Social media has blown that up. And um, so we were early, and and it, has, it wasn't easy, but it's kind of exciting to see, you know, that it's just collapsed this asymmetry that existed between, you know, the only way you got information was you had to go into a practice. And it's made for smarter patients, but it's also made for, um, like we're at a trade show, it's, it's a big industry now, and it's gone mainstream and global. And we've been at the cusp of that. It's been rewarding, but also um, 
you know, it's always a learning moment for me. For sure. You were very early and being early timing is everything in, in business. It is. Uh, you were very early, but that speaks to, that kind of connects right to the next thing I wanted to bring up, which is kind of the evolution of the business from now, from then till now. The little backstory to it is I got into aesthetic marketing about 12 years ago and I was pretty from pretty quickly. I would talk to our clients and they were interacting with real self in one way or the other. And they were definitely aware of it, whether they were paying for placements or they were answering questions. And I know the industry, I know that the business has evolved since then. I'd love to hear about that from your perspective, but I will say whether it's email or I'm browsing around on the site, it's the best content repository or whatever you want to call it database about about these procedures all in one place about this industry from consumer facing content let's let's make yeah, sure thank to say you that. for that it really is thank you but i'd love to hear about the evolution of yeah, i just gave a business. talk um yesterday um uh, in front of surgeons and practice managers as, and uh, i really talked about it's less about the evolution of real self and it's more the evolution of the consumer and how they make this decision um it it remains a very lengthy purchase decision uh, it, our data shows uh, over a quarter of all patients have spent more than five years considering, searching, looking. And what they're trying to find is a pathway to a doctor or practice they can trust with their body, face, or smile. And it's uh, a thoughtful exercise and a, um, a difficult one because it it's a very... Um, it's a very strange thing to be researching for something that you don't need to be doing. You know, it's just completely optional. It's, it's, um, so that journey when I first started the business was somewhat linear. You know, we, we, we've actually looked at our data and it's like step by step and real self was a hub or a stopping point, or we had a, a big relevance point in, and what is, was somewhat more of a linear, I go from this stage to this stage, your classic marketing funnel kind of thing. But, through not real self, but the fragmentation, and it's really we'll go back to the consumer and how we, you know, get it, you know, informed how we do things like podcasts and so forth. And actually I use podcasts as an example uh, in my talk, uh, that linear process has become just like a maze. And it's just, uh, when we've drawn it out, it just looks like scrambled eggs, you know, just like things are everywhere and the consumer is going everywhere and all over the place to find the information they need to find that provider, to find what's right for them, to f build that confidence. And if any one entity says they are responsible for delivering patient X to their practice, I think that's a fallacy. It's not Instagram. It's not real self. It's a, com it's a, it's a, it's a composition. And so for the surgeons who still work on real self today, we work with thousands. We are part of that mosaic. If they choose not to, then patients have to find them through different pathways. Um, and through, and it's an absence in that one touch point. doesn't mean it's the end of their practice or anything. It's just, it's just a different way to, you know, they want to reach the consumer and, um, the ones who work with us have tremendous success. Sometimes, um, it takes dedication. It takes, uh, patients sharing their experience with that practice. It's not just a pay and forget model, just like podcasting. It's quite an investment. You got to put in, um, but with that comes ROI, comes results, and um, but it's not for everyone. And so uh, that journey, going back to your comment, though, of that patient really, I think is the the way I would think about the, we are evolving as fast as we can. You know, we're working on AI, for instance, right now, um, for the reason it's like, we need to keep up with him or her as they are in in this mode of continuously finding uh, information and, and engaging on that. Well, I'm really glad you brought up AI because I want to talk to you about it and I have a specific reason I mean, we could we could work that into any conversation today, but there's this. You have to say AI, or yeah. you're <laughs> obligated. It's just like cloud, like right. We're in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true, but I have an actual, I promise you, relevant reason to bring it up. But before I do, I just want to say, the scrambled eggs, uh, a, a choice analogy. I don't know where I came back from. <laughs> but it is. It's just not a linear anymore. You mm -hmm. people say the funnel's dead, and now it's the flywheel, and all these things. But there's an interesting aspect that maybe makes those eggs even a little bit more scrambled, which is that patients come. Basically, as I see it, there's two key points in there where real self becomes a part of their their decision, their journey. Because I always look at the patient, the aesthetic patient journey is first just deciding to do this procedure at all, devoid of of uh, signing it to a surgeon or a provider. Uh, first, just finding actually backing it up. First, finding out what's even possible, that it is possible, being aware of it, and then 
which option among these different types of solutions that might solve the particular thing I want to solve do I want? Is it safe? All the questions. Now, and of course they blend, these two things get blended, the physician selection and the procedure choice. But they're two, they're two different parts. And so I feel like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's real self is very deeply embedded in both of those parts of the journey for those patients that do come across real self in that part yeah, of it. I'm glad you brought that up because it's, you know, we're talking about the journey of her or how we've evolved as a yeah. company. We actually spend, yes, there's a lot of that early stage getting educated, informed. I heard about this on some celebrity thing. We do see a lot of traffic coming in things like, what is Morpheus? You know, I've heard about this from some celebrity Instagram thing. Um, but we, probably if we looked at like 80, 20, you know, Pareto on our business of, of resources, probably 80% of our energy is on that bottom of the funnel. What happens when somebody is the hand raiser, wants to move forward? How do we make that connection as seamless and as frictionless as possible to a practice? Because that's where our why is made. Of course. That's where business happens. And we live in that world where business is what pays for everything. And so we have... In my talk yesterday, I said to, while we spend a lot of energy talking about top of the funnel, getting attention, getting likes, getting love, everybody feels that that sort of endorphin release when you get more listeners or whatever it may be that you're seeking. That comes at the expense sometimes of, well, what's your front desk doing? What what is that uh, lead life cycle? You know, what happens when they are speaking to you? Um, and what we see in our data is. 29 hour response times to the lead. We see 30 to 40%. I think Terry Ross talked about this too, or, or talks about this as well. 45% of leads get no response at all. And I come from a place of empathy. It's not the practice's fault. They were not designed and are designed to scale with the way technology and digital has taken them. The patients are, it's mainstream, like I said earlier, just means a lot more people are asking direct questions. They want to have an intimate relationship, meaning personal relationship with the practice. And they feel, well, I just have to click a little button on Instagram, and then I'm in a conversation with that company. Meanwhile, this front desk person is, who knows, I, I you know, a thousand activities a, a week they are handling. Spread thin. So we're working on things like online booking and scheduling. We are negotiating, leading with the technology infrastructure that practice use to open up APIs, to enable just an Airbnb experience to happen on platforms like ours, not um, an Airbnb experience where uh, call, dial, you have to call to find out if they're available. Do you remember when like it used to be like that right. like, rental unit right. and stuff? That doesn't work, right? Because we need instant gratification of knowing that's what we're going to say with our family or friends or whatever, your personal travel. So we, we are passionate about conversion. We are hyper-focused on what are the systems and processes we can do that not just for real self, but for practices, um, which we are doing with having a lander um, experience where Instagram traffic will land on a site page that we've designed to drive down to conversion. And we're seeing what is in many practices again, 3% conversion to, to consult from their Instagram traffic. We're able to 10 X that oftentimes. And so that's real money, real, uh, you know, it's real. It's huge. Um, but we're also working with brands and we've made our services and software available, white label, private label. So it's a lot there. That's a, a lot to unpack and probably beyond what your, your, your question was, but real self is, uh, and is much more than just a website with dot com, uh, you know, traffic, you know, it is, it is a, we have a services side as well as an, and a complete alignment with our customer basically to make them successful. We think at least. We're trying that. We have we have always room for growth on that. Yeah, well, all of that is really fascinating. I knew some of the scheduling and things that were in development. I've spoken with some of your team, or when they were in development. And I won't. And I wish we did unpack it all here today. But needless to suffice it to say, it's much more than simply this educational tool or a web sort of a like you said. It's certainly not. There's a lot more going on there, and I would love to hear a little bit more about it. But I know we're limited on time. I, I will say. It's interesting you brought up industry partners because what I find is a big disparity between patient uh, products and services with the patients already kind of educated on where there's a lot of DTC spend or where there's not. And, and, and the cost of education just goes right into the cost per lead and it becomes 
hugely expensive to get the to get the patient to understand what this even is enough to make a decision about it. Uh, I, I only bring this up because I'm sure you're thinking of these ways or you're already doing things around this, but I see real self as an excellent tool to close that gap on education. Cause when we have to bear the cost of education in a marketing campaign, it shows up in the cost per lead. Amen. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. It's something I preach about. And the other thing, I'm a passionate advocate of interoperability, no walled gardens, no dark pools, no silo data in our industry. So I love what you said about begging, pleading these. Yes. It, it, it's this balkanization of, of this industry's tech stack that's ultimately holding it back. Correct. I, I interviewed in my podcast, Hey Siri, uh, Clint Carnell, and I was just like, this, why is this not, you know, we're, we're excited when we hear numbers like $15 billion industry or something of that nature. Why isn't it 150 billion? Yeah. And it, one of my answers for that, Clint had, uh, had some very good insights, but uh, is ultimately um, it has to be keeping up with the consumer going back to her or him and the way they consume, purchase, prefer to conduct commerce. And that's, like I said, the Airbnb, easy, straightforward, got it done. So I want an appointment. Why do I have to make a phone call? And if I make a phone call, can I do it at 8 p.m. when my kids are in bed and I have time? And can I get a response in five minutes or less, which is what I would expect because you, you're going to treat me like a special patient. So all these things are very hard to execute as a small, medium-sized business. Um, but we want to be a partner in that. We have a lot of uh, uh, belief that we can break through. And I think we're going to talk about AI, but I think AI will also allow us to sort of potentially leapfrog over some of these um, these obstacles that exist in the technology world of, of practices and the cottage software solutions that, that, that exist. Yeah. Well, we, we're, we're like-minded in this. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that we need to continue to move forward and breaking those things down in this industry. AI. I wanted to ask what you were doing with it, but there's a specific reason. I know from a previous conversation we had, I think that day in the, the studio through Zoom, we were talking a little bit about people sort of thinking of real self and the old model as very Google dependent. And I'm, I know there is obviously still a search, a, a big search component of it. But as you said, you have suite of tools. I know you mentioned, because I see your email, I know you have a massive email program, and I know that's a massive part of what you do. But if I think about search, I'm really interested to see where search is going to go. And it's interesting that Microsoft essentially controls ChatGPT, and through their $10 billion investment into ChatGPT, and they've, they for the first time, they sort of beat Google to anything with, you know, they're all in. They're all in. And now Google's got basically caught flat-footed, struggling to kind of come out with their, to at least commercialize. They've been working on things for a long time, but to really kind of bring it to market and AI as it relates, they have deep mind, but AI as it relates to search, I don't really even know what the form factor entirely looks like. We see this chat interface, but what does it look like if I'm trying to find a surgeon? What do I, have, you, have you thought about this? It, it's so early, but. If you're not thinking about it in a role like yours or mine. Yeah you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of history. You're going to find there's the wrong side of the problem, which is, you know, you're, you're going to be irrelevant. And that's why, you know, the CEO, uh, Bill Gates, uh, the CEO of Microsoft, Bill Gates, and those folks, well, you'll hear them talk. They'll say, they're going to, they're not just kind of dipping their toes carefully measuring and like they're all in and they know it's going to be ugly. They know there's going to be some problems, but there is no choice. Yeah. This is the future state. Yeah. And it's, it's the next, you know, they almost missed the internet, right? That's the classic Microsoft. And now they're making up for it. They, I, I actually can't remember the CEO's name, the current CEO, but he has done an incredible job with a number of acquisitions and pivots and moves. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm in Seattle, Washington, so I'm in the, the heat of all these companies. Um, Amazon's even looking flat footed right now. Um, but that doesn't mean any one of us knows exactly what is going to manifest for our individual categories and business problems. But you know, the things that are redundant repeat that front desk example, those things you can see AI having a huge, you know, uh, assist. No question. You and I will probably have our own agents that are our own software bots or whatever they are that enable us to do our job faster and easier and better. No offense to your editors and so forth, but those things. We talk about it all the time recently, yeah. how much it's going to speed up workflow. Yeah. And already is actually. Yeah. You could chop this podcast up with AI tools and we could have little bits of it and, yep. you know, at right points and 
as one example, as you already know, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm no, no, but it's a, it's I'm not trying to mansplain you. No, you're not. And, and there's really examples that are really relevant today. And then there's, we can easily leap out to where we're not there yet. And it starts to get murky, but it's, it's good to point out use cases right now today. We're going to process this audio using AI and you won't hear most of the crowd behind us. Yeah. We've been playing with stuff and it's like incredible. Yeah. So in a company like ours, as an example, we've had, we have a 16 year old code base that used to be a, it's called legacy code. And, yeah. And that's, I don't know if we printed it out, you know, how big it is. It's hard to visualize how yeah. large it is, but it's a huge corpus of content or of, of, of code. Mm. And, and other companies have the same challenge and it's historically been just like, you need to just rebuild your whole system. But with AI, it can categorize, look through your entire code and know exactly where you may have a flaw or a vulnerability. Um, it can help you as a developer and programmer know how to basically accelerate the rate at which you can make changes. So you're just going to see more and more innovation come into spaces where you want an idea like, you know what, I want to create the new version of real self. You'll be able to tell a system to be, to create it. In our Touch case, the code. we want to, we want to run an experiment on, um, how podcasting integration in our platform will, you know, uh, elevates conversion. It should take like 10 minutes um, in the future. So those are just, maybe those are not as exciting as some of the things you hear about out there, but that's the, the reality is that it's about tooling and making, it's not about essay writing in college. It's not about that. I completely agree that, that we've talked about that now for several months. That's been the kind of conversation in the zeitgeist of today, but I think yeah. it's way more than that. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of reason to be maybe afraid of it and there's valid reason, but there's also reason to embrace it. And there's things we're going to look back on and can't, and we're not going to be able to imagine that we used to do those manually in the tedious way because of what AI has done. And we can think of examples throughout history where we used to do things that took us under some days and now they happen in seconds and that's going to happen all over again. But we don't know the answer, but I'm very curious because like I said, Bing became really relevant all of a sudden in the search world, at least in the conversations, it's threatening relevance. I don't know that we're there in terms of the actual numbers. Simply by saying, "Hey, we've got this integration with ChatGPT because we have we kind of have the advantage here," and it just got me thinking. Gosh, what is going to be the future of search? It's just it's not going to look. Apple's also big into search right now. We don't know exactly how that's going to manifest. We know obviously it will manifest in yeah, Siri product, if you will. You know, Steve. I think it was Steve Jobs who was famous for you know either you get disrupted or you disrupt yourself. Yeah, you, know, you have this. You actually you do have a choice. Which one do you want? Yeah. And the answer should be you disrupt yourself. So it, it, it is applicable to a medical practice. You know, it, you have to make changes. You have to make them proactively and in response to changes there. Or if they're going to happen to you by losing patients to somebody else who comes along and does it differently. In our case, if we're not paranoid, losing sleep, like assuming the whole world of search is going to go away overnight someday of traffic from companies like Google, then we're crazy. And I, I, that's a dereliction of my duty to my shareholders. So we are a hundred percent interested in chat GPT four in terms of cataloging, organizing, thinking of our content, building, building systems that answer questions, leverage our, like you, you're kind enough to point out earlier, we, we'd probably have the deepest reservoir of select content in this space it's it's ours for the taking to be the future um uh ai driven um pilot or co-pilot for aesthetics i've i've wondered if you've even thought about building an ai training model off of your data set that would be the aesthetic ai yeah my uh if my cto listens to this he would kick me under the table like just just like like let's let's get some Let's get some, you know, part of the thing is getting access to these, you know, to, to the right chat systems and all that, or to chat GPTs and all that. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, data training, and we're going to hear a lot more about training of, of models, but also of um, the cleanliness of the data. So with your podcasts, you know, there's some stuff that's really crisp and clean and real content, but then there's this self-promotional stuff. And that's what we've discovered is like, if a doctor says, which I've tried to train them over the years. Oh, come see me. I'm the best surgeon in all of, you know, St. Louis. That just contaminates the the data uh, and and the quality of that content. So that's an example of where it gets harder is that it it's, I guess I would call that almost like signal to noise problem where you're, you're getting that. 
the pollutive effect of that's not helpful content um, for for systems that are AI driven. Interesting. I could see AI helping to clean that up maybe too. <laughs> yeah, when you see the same thing over and over, come see me, come see me. Yeah, just, <laughs> he can say. <laughs> um, that that's actually quite. Uh, I I think ChatGPT four will. GPT three. We we did run a uh, hack week. Uh, thought around that and we discovered you know unanswered questions in our platform we put them through there and we did see it just was choking but we think the next the next iteration we're going to see we have already seen cleaner data from some of the stuff we're doing so cleaner outputs really exciting yeah I kind of had a good feeling you were going to have a really um, you know some some exciting things to say or at least interesting they're pretty they're not that that's sexy yeah because they're exciting so means that yeah i i think as a practice you know if a doctor's wrong well what does this mean for me uh ryan miller was the speaker in my session uh, he talked about that um i i think it's um going to be enabling the businesses to operate more efficiently like he said and um Will it be able to be, you know, Dr. Barry D. Bernardo bot and he it answers questions like he would want it? Um, yeah, of course, that will happen. Um, will it replace him in the surgicals um, theater? No, never, of course not. I think uh, going back to something you said, and I'm going to let you go here. I know you got to, you got to get on to other things. My lip is, yeah, I'm going on a luxurious flight on Alaskan Airlines for six hours. And you're heading home, but I heard recently you'd mentioned you're moving to Spain soon. Is that right? Yeah, I am. Uh, and somebody asked, it, "Are others involved?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, my family's coming." <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, uh, yeah, we're we're going as a family unit. Yeah, we're uh, my kids are young uh, still, and 10, 11. It's, it's it's just the right time for them to be, you know, just presented to a more of a global environment, global experience. I wouldn't mind some better weather. I love the culture. We have a we have a business there that um, is filled with incredibly thoughtful hardworking people and it just energizes me it's like you know in life sometimes you need a battery charge or a you know you know something to fill so i i find that that's going to be my you know from a selfish perspective but i do think it's going to be good for my family i'm not so sure for my wife yet if she's sold that's confirmed but we'll see well it's always worth an adventure i moved a few years ago and i'm still adjusting as well and maybe we'll move back to southern california where i was born and raised so worth a try though Might, might as well shake it up and um I wish you well in that in that endeavor, and thank you for sharing some of these the really thought provoking yeah. insights with us. Today. I'm so glad we got this time finally. And uh, you're the one who pulled me in on this, so I I'm, I really appreciate that, and I hope I can return the favor. Absolutely, we'll do it again sometime, and we'll get to unpack. I have so many more questions, but I want to be mindful of your time. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, thank appreciate you. it. Safe travels home. Thank you. <laughs>